beginning of a new day. This is a time span just like an inhalation and an exhalation, and a daytime span in which to resolve to be mindful, observe, alert, and pay attention during this span of time. Good morning, Puja. Reflections on the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. We're composing ourselves as a group. We corporate body, many people together doing one thing, like uh, chanting, um, composing our bodies and minds in, a, in one posture, one way, the group. It's a group meditation. Then the reflections on Buddha Dhamma Sangha, just to keep reminding ourselves what these really are. Yesterday I described what the qualities of the Buddha as the Bhagavan, the Arahant, the Samma, Sambuddha. And reflecting that this is a, something within each one of us is not a an entity outside or a historical event in time, but that very knowing alertness of being being aware that all that arises passes away is not and is not self. So the meditation is a practice of being, being attentive in the moment, not believing the thoughts and memories, doubts and worries uh, that cross the the mind. Aware, not annihilating them or rejecting, but not being caught up into them as as my problem is me and mine. This is the function of the Buddha, the knowing. Just that knowing is enough. The Buddha is the personification of wisdom. When we use the word Buddha rather than say, my wisdom, my wisdom is, I have this wisdom of knowing, we call it Buddha as a way of dispersing the, the tendency to claim wisdom as me and mine, because in the ultimate truth, wisdom is not a, doesn't belong to a being or a person, an individual. In, in the reflections of the Dharma, Santitiko akaliko ehi pasiko panaiko pajetang veti da povinuhi. We chant this every morning. Now the Dhamma has no personality. It's not personified in any way. You can't say Dharma is is uh, male or female. Dharma wasn't born through a through a woman. Dharma wasn't. Uh, wasn't conceived in any particular time. Dharma is, is not a historical sage. Dharma has no form. The, the Dharma is, uh, remains the formless, the un, uh, unformed, that which we, we can't perceive through senses. Buddha make no attempt to personify it. Personifications are done through Buddha and Sangha, but the Dharma remains impersonal. But they use the descriptions of Dharma not as in anything like saying it's red or blue, wonderful or miserable, but in terms like 
santitiko, here and now, imminent, at this moment, dharma. It's not something that's separate in time or in space. Our kaliko is timeless. Kala is time, and akala is not bound by time, not a time-bound condition. This is the, what they call the Kali Yuka in the Hindu tradition. The Kali Yuk. <laughs> the Yuka is a time, is a period of time. Kali always represents in the Hinduism of blackness, dark age, or the attachment to the time. Look how uh, much of our society is attached to time, to clocks and uh, schedules, schedules. (coughs) The Hindu goddess Kali is a Hinduism may have this voracious goddess, Mother Kali, that she gives birth and then she consumes what she gives birth to. And that's time, isn't it? Time consumes what it gives birth to. Anything born in time is destroyed by time. But the Nama is Akala. It's not that way, it's not time bound. Ehi Pasiko is term for come and see here and now. Don't wait for the future to do it. It's not something that you'll find at some future time, thinking that the Dharma, well, I'll, I'll look, uh, tomorrow I'll, I'll try to find the Dharma. I'll turn toward the Dharma tomorrow. Today, I don't have the time. Ehi Pratiko, even a, a sense of urgency, of come, and a kind of a command even. In fact, you have to, you have to go to it. You have to make that effort of turning toward it, uh, rather than waiting for it to come and tap you on the shoulder, say, here I am, the Dharma. This like in Christianity, say, knock on the door, and the door will be opened. And this is the kind of ehipathiko. You have to make that effort yourself, you have to turn toward it, you have to make, be alert and really aspire toward the Dhamma. And then opanaika, opanaiko means in, moving inward, inclining inward, not seeking Dhamma as something out there. Worshipping Dharma is some, something in outer space, up in the sky, something separate. But inclining inward, be attentive to the conditions of, of your own mind. And seeing that the Nibbana is in the mind, it's not something that you will find by looking outward and trying to find <coughs> it with, through your, as an object of sense or thought. And then Bhajitang Vaitidapo we knew he is only known through direct experience. He cannot no one else can give you the Dharma, not even Gautama the Buddha, Mahasi Sayadaw, Ajanta, any teacher, any other being cannot say, Here is the Dhamma. Then you say, Oh yes. This is it. It means you have to put forth the effort in your own life, be alert and attentive, and then you will know through direct experience, just like the taste of honey. You only know its taste, its flavor, when you actually taste it yourself. My tasting honey doesn't really help you to understand what it is. You don't know the flavor of it. (laughs) 
I might be able to write brilliant poetry about honey and give you a chemical formula but it's still you still won't know what its flavor is until you taste it the same with the Dhamma the tasting of the Dhamma that we're doing in meditation Now this, if you notice the, the, when we chant these qualities or characteristics of Dhamma, you don't really know anything about it, other than you have to be alert and mindful. You can't conceive anything that's akaliko, can you? What can you say? It's, a, it's not bound by time, it's timeless. What do we mean by time? What, what could not be, what could be outside of time? Try to think of something outside of time. And our thoughts are time-bound conditions themselves. So obviously thought is not the way to, to seek the Dhamma. Is it? We could write, try to write poetry about the Dhamma. And they write ecstatic poetry. Oh, the wonders of the Dhamma. The joy, the bliss, the, the perfect peace. <laughs> it's the supremest and the ultimatest. We could use most superlative forms of all adjectives. Like the Tibetan tradition are very good at that. Tibetan tradition always is applying superlatives to the ordinary. <laughs> but the, the Chinese, Chinese suttas all have these kind of super names. As if, as if we could, we get closer to the Dhamma by by describing it with superlatives. And yet in the Zen tradition, sometimes they bring it down to just ordinariness, like gathering firewood and drawing water from a well. So obviously language itself, any language, English or any other language, is not the vehicle for understanding the Dharma something we have to turn toward in our way, in our direct turning, an alertness, an attentiveness, a humility of giving up our own personal interests and desires and inclinations and habits to open, to be open, rather than to try to condition ourselves into being, becoming something else. So that sometimes people consider religious experience a kind of conditioning process where you, you kind of make yourself into a saint through being very moral and thinking very high thoughts and doing good action. But even though we might do all these things, and they're certainly good to do that, it's if we do not really open and let go of our desires and our views and opinions, and even to let go of goodness itself, saintliness itself, then we will never know the Dharma. We might know about it, we've heard of it, obviously, but knowing is something di- direct experience. It's not a knowing about. Like one can know about somebody. I like we know about peop- certain people. We we've, we've heard about them, but we don't know them. So in the meditation, when we take refuge in Dharma, it's an opening to the ultimate truth. 
not trying to find it or think about it or conceive it or have it or get uh, Ajahn Sumato's view of the Dharma and then get Venerable Sujito's view of the Dharma go around trying to get different people's opinions and views about the Dharma or waiting for some powerful sage to come along and zap you so you can have a Dharma experience or take a drug LSD or something like that maybe you can have a real Dharmic cosmic experience And you say, well, what is a dharmic cosmic experience? It's where you feel the absolute oneness with the ultimate supreme. You still don't know what it is. <laughs> that's all uh, what we, that's all uh, silly expressions, people describing ecstasy. thinking that use of superlatives in exotic words is, is relating a, a, a real experience in the Dhamma. We needn't say what it is. It's budgetown. It's something we know only through our experience of it. And that experience is not anything, it's not really an experience. It's an insightful uh, a way of letting go of self in which there's no longer anything to uh, understand or know an emptiness no freedom there's even the most superlative adjectives <clears throat> an exotic expression only like filigree around the, the spirit and have nothing more than just Function other than ornamentation. Mm. Now, what this <clears throat> does is putting the mind into a state of not instead of reaching out and trying to find something. We have to learn to be very, very patient and wait. Just wait. Learn to sit, stand, walk, lie down. Just waiting patiently, listening silently. Nothing to do, nothing. You don't have to go and look for it. Try to, if you sit here and you think, where is it? You start trying to find something. It'd be like chasing shadows. So in practice we take the attitude of just the gentle opening, silent listening, waiting patiently, humbly. And that's enough, that posture of just silent waiting. Noting any expectations, hopes, aspirations, noting these, but not being caught up into them, not believing them. But say for this day, today, being able to just sit, stand, walk, lie down, work, waiting, silently listening, watching, being alert from one moment to the next. Now thinking, well first I have to do this, and after the mind's quiet, then I will do that, and then We'll have to make it into some kind of uh, uh, exercise. And first I have to do my yoga practice, get my body into uh, proper condition, and then when that is, then I'll do the pranayama, and then get all the chakras uh, going, and then from that into the anapanasati to get the calm, and then then the letting go and just the kind of uh, bare awareness practice. So 
So something that's very simple and undemanding becomes a whole system of mental, physical exercises, views and opinions, various assortments of clinging, attachments, hopes, expectations, all kinds of mental conditions arise we aren't even aware of it. We just believe. First I've got to do this, and then I've got to do that. And then So patient waiting and listening means we listen to this. We're not that you shouldn't even think that you shouldn't think that. Don't even think that. But be aware of the thinking process, of the kind of habitual tendencies of your mind, the obsessions, fears, doubts, and worries. Listening to them as changing conditions. Like in uh, this kind of practice, we're not concerned with the quality of the conditions anymore. So, it's like counting the sand grains on the Ganges River, as they say. If you saw me uh, on the Ganges River counting each sand grain, picking up one and then saying, oh, look at this beauty. Isn't it lovely? Its color, its shape is so gorgeous. I go into ecstasy, though, and then I get to the next sand grain and think, oh, what a disgusting, ugly sand grain this one is. And I go on to the next one. This one is, is all right. Rather, it's neither very beautiful nor is it ugly. It doesn't really disgust me. I go on like that. How many eons of time would it take to count all the sand grains in the Ganges River? You just get too lost looking at each sand grain and admiring it or uh, analyzing it. Reacting to its beauty or its ugliness. But all we have to know is that the sand grainness of sand grain, we don't have to know that is their particular color pattern just knowing that all sand grains are just that. Therefore, we don't have to bother to count them all. We don't have to go one, two, three. We don't have to uh, analyze them. We're just looking at that which is common, that characteristic which is common to all sand grains. The Gandhi's River is at their sand grain. The same with condition of the five khandhas, the body and mind. They're all just conditions. Some are beautiful conditions, some are ugly, some are neither beautiful nor ugly. But they're all just conditions. We don't, we're no longer trying to, to analyze each condition, figure it out, where did it come from, become entranced by its beauty or repelled by its ugliness. We're just looking at the condition, conditionness of condition. The sankharas, as they say in Pali. And noting that the characteristic of all conditions is change. In nicca, dukkha anatta. So that we're not, uh, spending our time trying to figure out which conditions we should keep and which conditions we should throw away. But just patiently listening and watching that any condition that arises passes away and is not self. Now this is a, a different kind of looking things in a different perspective than, say, the kind of way you've trained your minds before, where you become entranced by the qualities of conditions, or fascinated, or repelled, or bored by the quality of the thoughts you have, or the memories that, that, go, that move through your mind. 
and the university training and all the kind of mental training that you that you've uh, experienced in your life so far has been the kind where you become fascinated or repelled. You're caught up in the quality of the conditions of body and mind, of the world around you. But this practice is no longer concentrating on quality, but on the characteristic of change. A condition in this word, when I use condition, the English word condition, it means anything that is arises and passes away, anything that is, uh, has that characteristic of change. And in this, the Buddha described the five khandhas or the five aggregates, like in this morning we chanted. Rupanga nichang, vedana nicha, sanya nicha, sankara nicha, vinyanang nichang. These five khandhas, rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vinyana, are impermanent. Now, all the, these five aggregates or five categories include everything that we perceive, conceive, and know through the senses, so the body, and all the conditions of the mind and we reflect on the impermanent characteristic of these conditions. And the same with rupanganatha, vetananatha, sanyanatha, sankaranatha, vinyananganatha. Not self, not me, not mine. The body, the form is not me, not mine. The feelings are not me, not mine. The memories and perceptions of the mind are not me, not mine. Conceptions, thoughts are not me, not mine. And vijnana, consciousness, is not me, not mine. Then we chant, sape sankara nicha. All conditions, all compounded conditions are impermanent. Sape tamana dati. And all dhammas are not self. So in this, sape tamana dati is a way of letting go of claiming even the ultimate realization as a personal attainment. In other words, practice is a, is a constant silent listening, alertness, attentiveness in the moment. It's not something that you'll get an insight and, and suddenly you claim, oh, I'm an enlightened being. I have, I have attained Nibbana. <laughs> that kind of thought itself is just another condition, changing. Just the patient knowing that even thoughts of that nature are impermanent and not self, not to believe even, uh, or grasp any kind of, of ecstatic experience or even grasp any kind of insight. This is another problem with meditators is that they grasp their insights. You do begin to have insight into the truth and then you start grasping it. Because through memory you remember some brilliant moment, some great insight, you, some realization and then your desire is to claim it is me and mine. I have insight. I saw this. I understood at that time. I felt the absolute oneness of the ultimate truth. Remember that. <laughs> but that's only a memory, isn't it? But the point is not in remembering insight but living insightfully in this moment, the next moment, the next moment, being alert, attentive.
sharing of merit, punya. As this new day begins, we can reflect also that what we do today, how we live our life, has its effect on the universe we live in. So just our very silent listening and patience our good actions are refraining from acting on selfish impulses, cruel impulses. Our keeping of the sila, our practice of the dharma, all this is, is meritorious. And this, what we mean by this is a kind of goodness or grace or that which is good accumulates around us when we live a good life, or kind, generous, charitable. When we practice the Dharma, when we keep the sila. Now, this we also see is something that we do not accumulate for our own self, but a way of of humbly, mentally, emotionally offering this goodness or this grace for the welfare of all sentient beings. So that in your practice here the idea is not to practice just to get something for yourself, to get enlightened, to get out of suffering, but also to offer any good results, any great merit or goodness from your practice, offering it back for the welfare of all sentient beings. In other words, we, how can we help the third world, people ask. What do you do for the third world? Sitting in your monastery, doing all those chants and watching your breath. You should be out helping the third world. Of course, people that usually say that aren't doing anything much to help the third world. <laughs> They're out build a toilet in India or something. <laughs> but this 
is helping the third world. I'm the second, I'm the first. In any worlds that are fourth, fifth, or sixth, all sentient beings, because in this way, they, this, this practice of Dharma has it. If, if, if I practice it and my life is, is right and in balance, then that has its effect on all sentient beings. If my life is led selfishly and stupidly, then it also has its effect on all sentient beings. And I figured out years ago that there... Now this, this practice of sharing of merit is also a way of of praying for other beings, a kind of Buddhist prayer, you know, you, that, you're, that your mother is ill, she's depressed or unhappy, and there's nothing you can do for her. You can't, you've done what you can, but you still, you can still say, go out and do charitable action and offer this action, any goodness or grace from this action, the, the way of a, May this be of benefit to my sick mother. In other words, you're using some unpleasant situation in your life, concern for someone else that's close to you, and when you really can't do anything, then you do good action in the world. Help someone else who does need help, who you can help in some way. Some kindness in this, and offer this merit, this grace for the healing of your mother or friends. This psychologically very valid, very useful way of doing it. For the third world, for the uh, nuclear arms race, for the all the, uh, for the American government, for the Soviet government, for the Iranian government, all government. In England, I, every day, we, we share a merit with Queen Elizabeth. I don't know if she appreciates her. <laughs> with Margaret Thatcher. Some people in England find that hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> We aren't, uh, we aren't taking political sides. We're sharing merit with all sentient beings. Now this also opens up the possibility of sharing merit, say, of, of doing good action in the world. Well, this kind of reflection, like if we begin the day with this attitude of of sharing punya, then we are careful, more careful of how we live our life during this day. So that we will say, if, we, if you are just at home, you have to go to work, you have to do things, you're not here at a meditation center or at a monastery, then you uh, say, it also will remind you to say, go to your office, your factory, school or whatever with an attitude of giving and sharing rather than of getting dwelling in aversion on or resenting or begrudging the changing uh, our way of looking at things even on this, this conceptual level changing the way we look at the life that we're living the beings that we live with the world that we live in we can complain about the way the world is. There's plenty enough to complain about. You read the newspapers, it seems to be hopeless kind of crisis, world problems. Plenty to complain about, about the present government, and the economic, political, social problems of the United States, of the world. But constant complaining and discontentment only breed negativity wherever we go. I go up to you and I say, oh, the terrible things they're doing in 
the government, oh the awful things in the economy, oh the hopelessness of the society, all the crime and violence, oh it's, everything is, the society is going to the dogs. And then after I chewed you up with that, you told you some, about some terrible scandal, some terrible kind of uh, violent atrocity, and you go on to the next person and you think, oh, I heard today that there's this terrible scandal and atrocity and the world is going to the dog and everything is hopeless. And you go and spread good cheer throughout your day like that. <coughs> so we develop a whole, a whole network of negativity, just poking at each other, complaining, oh, look, at, in England they're good at complaining about the weather. Actually, the English climate is quite pleasant. It's not, it's quite a temperate country and it, it's, not, it's a very pleasant place to live, but English people insist that it is, that their climate is the worst in the world. So, <laughs> So, uh, uh, they convince everybody that it is. So by the time you go to England, you, you're already biased. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a way to start a conversation. It's the English way of being friendly. They, oh, it's raining again. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a, a negative way, isn't it? It tends to create in, in, in people this complaining mind. Oh, the pound is dropping. Oh, the unemployment, percentage of unemployment is rising. Oh, <laughs> and so forth. Spend our days with these cheerful little tidbits of life. And we wonder why mental illness is on the increase, why people get depressed and can't get out of their depression, why the mental hospitals are filling up. Because we're, we're also responsible for that, you know, in, in our lives as we complain, spread negativity and discontentment wherever we go, where that's our, we're also responsible for that for what we say and how, how we live in the world. So this sharing of merit is a skillful kind of practice. It doesn't mean you're being goody-good, Pollyanna-like, but it's a positive kind of expression of doing and living in the world in a way that is useful, helpful and kind. So that our, our life as, as meditators, as religious seekers, as Buddhists or yogis or just as human beings, as a man or woman, is a positive, has, a, has, a, has a positiveness, a movement of, of effort toward that doing that which is good, and kind, and charitable in the, in the world that we live in, in the society we live in doesn't mean we're blind to the faults of it. We certainly, our discriminative faculties are highly developed already, so we're certainly aware of the faults and flaws and imperfections. But like in your own practice of meditation, to dwell constantly on the imperfections of yourself, the faults, is it only leads to misery and constant suffering. Same with the society learning to be within a society, even though it's very imperfect, but being that which is, say, a, a force of dharma, of truth, of, of good action, generosity, charity. And this will definitely help and be of use and of service to all sentient beings.
So in this reflection, we reflect on the um, the monks. We always reflect on our upachaya, our preceptor, because having been ordained as a bhikkhu is a great honor. So that the man or the monk that ordained us is always has a very special place in our life. It's something that our life as a monk, uh, the our good practice, meritorious actions good sila and all this as a way of repaying that our preceptor for giving us this opportunity to be a a bhikkhu and for those of you who aren't bhikkhus to do this to your teachers and bhikkhus we do it to our teachers like I spread this merit this punya to Ajahn Chah You can share this, this punya with me, Venerable Sujita, or with Jack and Joseph, or with Dharma teachers who have, have uh, helped you in some way, whether they're Christian or Buddhist or whatever, it doesn't make any difference. Those who have taught you uh, to be good, to refrain from doing evil, have helped you to understand more clearly the truth than with your parents. With your husband, wife, brothers, sisters, children, relatives, and good friends. all those people you know that you like that are ill or unhappy to live this this day spend this day practicing developing your practice humbly waiting patiently listening not as an end in itself for, for your enlightenment but also offering any goodness or merit from this practice as an offering to say your parents or your friends or those you know who are unhappy or sick. Then we also offer the merit to our enemies, to those people we know that we don't like, we can't stand. Who have hurt us or humiliated us cause us some pain. <laughs> to the government, to President Reagan, to Congress, all the people in power in this country who make decisions, with the uh, all the happy good devas of the universe, the celestial beings, with all the malevolent forces in the universe, with all the animals. Let's think of how we exploit animals just for our own greedy purposes. We think we have little cats and dogs that we like, we can love, and we can, it's easy to, to share merit with our dear little cat, lovable little dog, our horse, or animals that we keep for pets. But then there are the animals that we eat all the time, exploit, cows and pigs, chicken, ducks and geese, sheep and so forth we, we think we, we, that it's our right to just take their lives and use their animal hides and so forth but we never we never, we never think of sharing merit with a cow or a pig <laughs> well, they've, done, they've helped us in all kinds of ways these animals nourished us and 
but to share merit with say, all these animals that we've exploited and that we like to eat and use that help us like horses and and uh, all that cow, the milking of cows Thailand you have the water buffaloes very useful animal that pull the plows all these chickens that lay eggs the way of recognition of reminding ourselves of that uh, all these sentient beings of the same life force wanting to live, not wanting to die having fear feeling pain and pleasure a recognition of this and so that we when we reflect on this we're more careful of how we live not just taking for granted that somehow we have the right to exploit the animal world for our own pleasure and convenience and then all the animals that we don't like like mosquitoes and these black flies when you're out in the garden to the sun remember that you're sharing merit with the black flies <laughs> in Thailand we do it with the mosquitoes it doesn't mean you love black flies you can share merit with, with, with all sentient beings with the people you hate we're not asking you to like or love everything, but this sense of, of complete open giving and sharing, regardless of personal preference. Then the sharing of merit with all the unfortunate, unhappy people that, in the world that we don't know about, such as those locked away in prisons, in prison camps, in mental institutions, those that live in the world of, of constant uh, fear anxiety people addicted to drugs uh, alcohol uh, sexual aberrance people that have to live in constant misery and and uh, obsession this way of say, offering any merit any uh, grace from our lives for their welfare well you see psychologically this sharing of merit is a way of opening up the heart here you're expanding you're not limiting saying only this group only only the Buddhists only the Buddhists that keep the sila only the Buddhist meditators that come to the insight meditation center only the Theravadan Buddhists and the only the Theravadan Buddhists and the Venerable Raja would feel hurt even with the Tibetan Buddhists <laughs> the Mahayanists and the Zenists Christian So this is a prayer, I'm just giving <clears throat> this this morning as a way of, for, for reflection in your own life the attitude of the sharing of punya this is, this will have its beneficial effect on your practice too because in practice as I was saying it is an opening, it's not sitting here to get something if I sit here long enough I'm going to get enlightened but it's a patient waiting and an opening up it's not a sitting here closing down and shutting everything out somebody comes and coughs and you think ooh wish that person would drop dead It's a patient waiting, silent listening, an opening of the heart, 
and then this attitude of giving out because our life this life here this being here is not is not separate from the universe it, it is the universe <clears throat> Ahang sukito homi, niduko homi, awero homi, abaya pajo homi, aniko homi, zuki atam nam bari harami, rabe sata sukita hundu, rabe sata awera hundu, Zabe sata paya paca hundu Zabe sata nika hundu Zabe sata suki atanam pari harandu Zabe sata sabadu gaba mujandu Zabe sata lata sampati doma vika chandu Sabe sata gamma saka gamma tayata gamma yoni gamma bandhu gamma bhati sarana Yam gamma gale sandhi gale yanam va papa kangva dasa dayata bhavi sandhi And this now just sit comfortably, relax. This attitude of metta towards yourself, just feel at ease and at peace with your own body and mind. Just kind of sweep through the body with this metta, kindness, friendliness, inner ease. Just relax inwardly and be at peace with all the cells of the body. The blood vessels, the nerve endings, all the organs. Sit here and, and just reflect on the body itself and it is friendly, friendliness, kindness, ease, with all these solid elements, liquid elements, the air and fire in the body, the spaces. having metta for all your internal organs. The body likes this practice very much, it responds very nicely. It's metta for, for your kidneys, liver, heart, intestines, lungs, for all your sense organs, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, the brain, skeleton,
Patipanno Bhagavato Savaka Sankho Sankhanamami <coughs> <coughs> 